Hello everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you're having a great afternoon. Uh, my name is Lorna and I'm a member of the team here at the Student Room. And I'm your host for today's TSR Answers. I've got a great co-host in the background as well, Sam, so if uh, my internet should completely disappear for any reason, he'll be able to jump in and carry on. So TSR Answers. This is a series of 12 live streaming events to help answer your questions, covering lots of topics, including your education, your future, your well-being and your life. If you missed last week's session, all about exams, you can go back and watch that. And next week, we'll be covering managing loneliness and relationships in lockdown. But for today, our focus is all about how COVID-19 and its fallout may affect your university experience, whether that's getting in or deferring, um, or what your online learning might look like, or even whether you can move into halls. I'm joined today by an incredible panel with huge amounts of experience who will try to answer your questions and give some sense of clarity to what your future at university will look like. So, I'm going to introduce them one by one. First up, we have Nicola Dandridge from the Office for Students. Welcome, Nicola. Hi there, Lorna. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the session and hearing from students. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, next, we have Sam Matthews, Head of Admissions at the University of Westminster. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Hi, Sam. Uh, next up, we have Vivian Stern, the Director of Universities UK International. Welcome, Vivian. Hi. Hi. Very nice to be here. Looking forward to it. Fabulous. Thank you for being here. And um, last but not least, we have Ruth Swan from Harriet Watt. Welcome. So great to have you here. Hi there. Thank you, Lorna. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, so we've had a lot of questions um, from you guys and we'll be doing some live questions as well. So, so get those in if you have them. And we're going to go straight into, I think, one of the biggest um, topics of conversation for students, and that's around referral and admissions. You know, the big question really is about, will I, allowed, will I be, able, be allowed to defer my place if I want to after I affirm because of COVID-19? Some questions straight to you to start off with. It's a difficult one. Will students be able to defer their place? Um, yes, definitely. I mean, the process every year is that students change their mind. They want to take a year out. They want to work or travel. And this is no different um, to any other year. Um, apart from the fact that obviously now um, things are, are slightly different with unable to travel um, and obviously employment may not be out there. Um, however, the process is exactly the same and right up until they're about to join university, there is always that option for them to defer um, and take that year out. Ruth, do you have the same kind of experience as Sam there and, and the same kind of policy there? Yes, so at Heritage Walk, we, we certainly will be accepting any requests um, to defer and we will look at those. Um, there is a limited amount of um, places that we will be able to, de to defer to. Um, but we would also take a very personalised approach to, to anybody that is requesting a deferral, that we would speak to them to make sure that it was for the right reasons and to make sure that they fully understood what um, what their experience would be like if they went ahead with studying in this September start, um, just to make sure that, that it was the right thing for them. Mm, um, I think that kind of comes on to the next question then from user Chin2511. So this user says, many people are deferring entry to university who are currently in year 13 to September 2021. Will that make it more difficult for people who are currently in year 12 who want to apply for a 2021 entry to be successful in securing a place? considering that there'll be more people beginning in 2021. If it's more difficult, would you recommend that those applying for September 21, who are currently in year 12, then also defer to 2022? Nicola, what, what do you think there? It's a really good question, but I think the danger is people can start um, trying to anticipate what's going to happen. And actually, I don't think any of us really know what's going to look like in 2021 or 2022 so I think the only sensible advice in these circumstances is that you have to make the right decision for you so don't try and second guess what's going to happen if you feel it's the right thing for you to do to defer then explore that with the university you're planning to go to if you're not then then don't and I think don't try and anticipate too much because it's it's too uncertain. Vivian what, what do you think? I think Nicola's right. I mean, we don't know where things will be um, in autumn 2021. You know, so much is un unforeseeable about the way that this um, this uh, pandemic will evolve. Um, I think what you've heard from the two universities represented here is sort of it in a nutshell. Just talk to the university. I mean, if you're thinking about deferring from this uh, autumn entry, 
the reasons you might be doing that are kind of uncertainty about how teaching and learning opportunities will be delivered, you know, what the experience is going to be like, will you be safe and well looked after? And frankly, the way to get answers to those questions is to talk to the university. Um, but I agree with Nicola that I think if you're making a big sort of life move, um, deferring when you really don't know what 2021 and 2022 are going to look like is, you know, I wouldn't do it just for that reason, but it all depends on personal circumstances. That's, that's a great answer. There's, there's also kind of follow-up question um, to Tim's question from a user called spicy underscore iPad. Um, they're asking a similar question about will it be more difficult to get into 2021? But their question is specifically for very competitive courses like medicine. Um, they say, won't the students who have deferred be at an advantage in terms of having more work experience or more volunteering, etc., and then have a benefit over regular 2020 ap 2021 applicants who have had work experience cancelled? Sam, what, what do you think about that one? Um, I mean, it's difficult to comment because um, Westminster do not run medical courses um, and I haven't worked in that sector uh, with medical courses for quite some time. But I am obviously this year there has been lots of guidance put in place um, so that universities are all treating students in exactly the same way and allowances are being made and things are being put into place because obviously exams have been cancelled. And I'm sure going forward, obviously, we're very much focusing on trying to get things right for the students that are coming in a few months time. But I'm sure with the government, um, universities will be working to, to move forward to make sure that everyone has a fair opportunity for the coming cycles. Nick, I guess kind of move that question to you. Obviously, we, we know that the government has released um, some additional funding for healthcare places. Do you feel that there may be um, a disadvantage to, to students coming in later not having had that experience or, or do you think those extra places will help out? I think whatever else we have learned from the coronavirus uh, pandemic is that medical places are completely critical and we know that the government is very keen to see more students choose to study um, medicine or uh, the professions allied to medicine, nursing, midwifery and so on. So there's a real demand to see those places um, and be available to students. And I, I, I think it's rather similar to the previous point. I, I don't think it's right that people should be trying to work out what the future is likely to hold. I think they've just got to make the right decision for them. And picking up on a point that was made earlier, I mean, universities are really keen to try and provide support to students in these circumstances at the Office for Students with a regulator um, for higher education in England. And one of the things we've been really emphasizing to universities and colleges is that they, they, they must show support and sympathy to students, accommodate the, the extraordinary situation they're in and making sure that they're providing as much information and support as they can to them. So I think in answer to that question, it's the same as before really, just speak to the universities and try and get a sense from them as to what the best thing to do is. And, on the point about getting more work experience during the course of the next year. I mean, I think the difficulty is we don't quite know what the working environment is going to be and therefore what jobs might be available to provide that work experience. So I think it goes back to the same point as we said before, just speak to the university and don't try and anticipate too much what the future is going to hold. So it's, it's so difficult, isn't it? Having lots of questions that we, we uh, just can't answer because the future is so, so um, uncertain. We have a few questions here about specifically about international admissions, which, which Vivian, you might be able to help with help best with here. So um, one question is from user Mad Ox Med. Uh, they're an international student from the Netherlands and um, they're actually currently doing their GCSEs. Um, but this student is looking really far ahead uh, and, is, and is considering things. So um, they are um, doing their GCSE equivalent exams, year 11, they'll be taking place in June at their school, but in different exam conditions. They'll only have had education through online classes. As whether these differences in exam policies for GCSE equivalents all around the world will affect the way year 11 exams will be regarded in the UK application process. So if that's a question for me, I would say that all universities are um, working on the basis that where other exam systems have produced results, albeit uh, in a different way uh, than they would normally do, that those will be treated as equally valid as qualifications received in the normal way. That's what the UK system is doing with A-levels, which are being uh, awarded on the basis of teacher assessment with a degree of um, external, uh, you know, some external moderation around that. Um, mm. And the, the principle on which the whole system is working is that students shouldn't be disadvantaged due to factors that are outside their control. 
but my colleagues um, will be able to sort of tell you from an institutional perspective how they're dealing with that. Perhaps I should add though, that we know that lots of exam systems haven't yet uh, determined how they'll be producing results and crucially when, and that's creating a bit of anxiety for people. Mm. What I would say is we're trying very hard to make sure that we collect information about when examination systems are going to produce results and how. Uh, we've got an organization in the UK called NARIC, which is providing information to institutions about that. Um, and my, my assumption and impression from all the universities I've talked to is that they will be really quite um, flexible where possible. Obviously universities need to make, maintain um, standards. Nobody wants to admit students who aren't equipped to uh, succeed in the course, um, but they will be flexible because everybody understands these are very unusual times. Absolutely. Ruth, I can see you nodding, on, nodding along there. What do you have to add? Yes, uh, just to just to say to yeah, Vivian's point, I completely agree. Um, we, yes, it's been it's been quite a an unusual year for us all. Um, but we are certainly looking to be flexible as much as we possibly can be, um, and looking at every market that we are getting students from, and working closely with um, colleagues that are working in those countries and with NARIC colleagues as well. Um, to we. The calculated grades that we will be receiving um, will be treated exactly the same way as um, they would have been any, any other year. Um, and exactly that, that there's some countries yet that we still to get some confirmation from, but we do continue to be flexible, but always putting the student at the core and making sure that we are doing what is right for them. And, and something that I, I think if it would be okay, I would make a point on just now that also is relevant here, but to the discussion earlier about deferred entry mm -hmm. is that this year, there will be additional consideration to, to those students that perhaps haven't had the opportunity to complete qualifications and that their learning wouldn't be at the same standard as they perhaps would be if they were coming any other year. And academics in certainly our university and, and many others that I'm aware of, are going to be taking that into consideration um, for first year students when they're starting and making sure that we are providing every support that we can to make sure that our students are building that foundation knowledge along. We have an example at Heriot what we have something called maths gym for, for our students that are coming in that perhaps feel they need additional support with their the mathematics background to help them in engineering subjects, for example. Um, and that's gonna be rolled out to anybody that perhaps hasn't been able to complete your, their A-level maths and, and need that extra support. So that is one benefit for, for continuing with their academic studies this year and not deferring to next year, that they will have that extra support and understanding by not only the colleagues, but also their community, their, their fellow classmates. Mm. That sounds like a, a really excellent scheme. I'm sure I could do with a maths gym even now. Um, <laughs> Sam, homeschool if you want, that's quite good. Pardon? If you're doing homeschool, you get a kind of crash course in there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, Sam, did you have anything to add on, on that point around um, kind of being flexible? There, there is also a question actually from an international student specifically asking, you know, whether unis might be more lenient um, with near miss candidates for, for this year to make, well, they said make up the numbers. Um, Sam, what, what's your view of that one? I mean, um, I second what Ruth says. Um, I mean, obviously, yes, we will, um, students will, um, they're unable to complete their studies. Um, we will be looking at ways in which we can assure that they've They've met the requirements um, and we can review their applications. I think it's important to say that in any normal year, um, when it comes to students receiving their, their results, universities do take um, a very holistic approach. Um, and it's not just about grades. It's about um, what a student can offer um, to their studies. Um, so all applications are always reviewed once um, examination results are received. Um, and us, um, like other universities, are looking at what support can be put in place for students um, when they arrive for their first year, because, as we say, many of them have been out of education for several months now. So many institutions are looking at how we can support them returning to studies, um, however that may be. Fantastic. The next question is quite, um, quite a big, nervous question. Um, and of thinking about the future of higher education. So this is user SamCall9092. And they say, with a lot of universities coming up with cheaper online courses, what do you guys think is the future of university education? What would your advice be for, for example, prospective international students studying a master's in the UK? Um, so it's kind of a two part question. So, you know, what do you think about this, the future of, of university education um, out of this? And, uh, and do you have any advice for a prospective international student wanting to be postgrad? 
Nicola, what, what do you think about that one? Such a huge question. What do I think <laughs> about the future? I think as we uh, in uh, this country, but also countries across the world, uh, emerge from this crisis, we are going to need graduates. The economy is going to need graduates. So I think there's always going to be, there always has been a demand for, for graduate skills, but I think that's even more so now. So I think in that respect, it's really positive. I think what is interesting is um, this question of whether or not the focus on online teaching is really going to shift the dialogue. Because I think what we've seen is that the some online provision is is completely outstanding and some of it is less so. And what we may see over the next few months is the standard, the bar rise as universities really get to grips with what high quality online teaching looks like. And I think certainly what we're seeing from universities is that they're trying to move towards a mixed model of online and face-to-face. -face. And the question is whether or not that's going to become the new norm, not just because it's what the universities think is appropriate given all the social distancing constraints, but more importantly, whether that's what students want. And I think to answer the second part of the question, is that what international students are going to want? Are they going to be really nervous about traveling, um, reluctant to uh, leave their homes? and therefore much more interested in online provision. And I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, probably your question there is better place to answer it. I think it's something that universities are very live to. We certainly um, at the Office for Students are very live to that and really keen to see how this rolls out. Mm. Uh, same question to you, Vivian, kind of the future of, of university education, particularly in the UK and uh, any advice for that international student looking to study postgrad level? Well, I think, I mean, from the applicant point of view, the prospective student point of view, the, the positive um, story is there's going to be more choice. You know, as Nicholas says, I think we've seen this rapid evolution in online delivery. It was already uh, something that was sort of extensively offered. Um, other forms of learning, for example, where UK universities have partnered with a university in another country and they're delivering provision collaboratively. Other forms of blended model, you might spend a couple of years in your own country and then come to the UK to complete a degree. Um, and all of that was there before this um, crisis put rocket boosters under the, uh, the delivery of um, education online. And there are some advantages. I mean, I've heard stories, I've been doing a lot of sort of conversations with um, international students who are still in the UK at the moment, um, find out what they're, what they're sort of going through. And there are some real kind of advantages to it. Some people say that they find the kind of interaction with, with, um, with teaching staff easier uh, through this mechanism, especially if you've come from a system which is quite didactic where what the professor says goes and you sit in the back and listen thank you very much you don't get stuck into a heated debate that's quite a difficult thing for some students to overcome when they're sitting in a in a sort of seminar room uh, surrounded by lots of peers they may be held back and so it's quite interesting that there might be ways that this technology you know sets free people who are kind of struggling to engage with the way that we teach in the in the UK um, but, you know, ultimately, the, the decision is quite a personal one. If you go and study in another country, um, you know, I've done it in a modest way. Lots of the people I work with have done it in a modest way. Um, and the experience goes a little bit beyond the education you receive. It's um, time you spend with uh, colleagues from in universities in the UK right around the world. I mean, you go to a big, um, you know, university in the UK and there will be students and staff from 150 plus countries you'll you know you obviously you have the opportunity to experience life in the UK to immerse yourself in language and culture and those things do add something to the experience um, and I know a lot of people are therefore wondering you know why come this year because if if my education is going to be delivered partially online will I miss out on that and I think what we're starting to see is universities come out with plans for how they're going to um, start to ease back into that partially face-to-face, -face, partly online model. And there are lots of um, announcements that have come out over the last couple of weeks that have confused people. Cambridge in particular saying that they're going to be delivering lectures um, online for the year has been interpreted by some people as saying, well, there's no point in going then because I'm not going to get any face-to-face -face teaching. And as I understand it, that's not really what's been proposed. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it goes back to what I said a while ago, talk to the university you're interested in, find out what they're um, but most universities, unless we find ourselves in a situation um, later this year where really we are in the strictest possible lockdown conditions, there will be some form of campus life. It may be socially distanced, it may be that some things that are quite hard to deliver in that way, including, uh, you know, in some cases lectures where the facilities aren't very well adapted to that, 
might be online, but there's going to be more of a blended approach. So I think that's quite important to understand and to understand how your university particularly will deal with that. This brings us actually really, really well on to the next set of questions, which is really all about online learning, as I, I'm sure you can imagine. Lots of questions about um, that hybrid approach and also the facilities. So um, kind of one, one big question here um, is, is there going to be any guidance to institutions on what constitutes a suitable online course and what would class as unsuitable to justify paying for tuition fees? This is kind of two sides of that, you know, one big part of that is what's good teaching and the second part is, is that linked to fees. Um, so straight to you, Ruth. Uh, kind of what's your view about um, how to look at what constitutes a really good online um, provision and then the link to tuition fees? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so certainly there, there's going to be an element of um, blended learning, as Vivian was saying there, for, for many of our institutions in the UK are going to be looking at this provision of both a joined up approach of online and some face to face. The question for our students when they are, if they are still in that decision making process, as you say, reaching out to those universities and doing a research to see how they're, they're approaching it. Um, and, and perhaps also remembering that a lot of our universities are quite well versed in the, the online learning. A number of us have um, some very successful online programs that we've, we've been able to learn from. Um, and also we have been running a, an element of our of our um, last academic year online for our for our current students and we have taken learning from that and we've been working very closely with our students as many universities will they'll be working very closely with their students to to figure out what's working and what we need to improve on so we feel that we've gotten to a stage now that we've we've learned a lot about what we need to do to to make sure that everything that we do we're putting the student at the core and their experiences um their student experience is, is absolutely priority for us. Um, so I would say it's, it's having a look at their experience already in online learning and having a look at perhaps the current student experience. Um, and through the, the last few months, we've, we've had some really good feedback from our students about the real positive opportunities that the, this past few months has, has actually brought. And they found that they have, like was mentioned earlier, they've felt closer to their academic staff, that closer to their lecturers. They felt they were able to reach them a lot easier. So there, there has been a lot of learning from that. Um, so yes, having a look at to see what, what the universities themselves are offering. And, and also to remember that this isn't necessarily going to be for forever. This is there's going to be some plans put in place to make sure that we can start teaching and get everybody up and running in, in the start of the academic year. Um, and it will be a blend for us at Harriet Waters. It's, it's face to face teaching where possible. And then um, where it's not possible, um, such as this, Vivian mentioned, the, the, lecture, the lectures or if a student themselves can't get to campus, they'll be able to access and it's online teaching. And that's something to remember that there's a difference between online materials that they can access and, and learn from home and actually online teaching where they are still in part of a community and part of a learning um, body of other students that they'll be able to engage with. It's not just one person at home logging in and watching a, a pre-recorded video. So that's also those kinds of questions that they can be asking is what will it look like? Will it, will it be materials that I can access or is it actually going to be a virtual classroom? Um, and a lot of universities are investing in technology at the moment to allow that um, the possibility of that community to, to be available to our new students and, and our ongoing students as well. Um, so I would say that's uh, hopefully that's kind of answered the, 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 the question about what online learning might look like. And um, I'm sure there's probably more that we can add to that. Um, but and, and also there will be more that we can add to that over the coming months when we're when we're pulling that um, together. I do know that our, our university, I'm sure it'll be the same for many others, that uh, a lot of our academics are, are in lots of planning phases at the moment and rolling out what that will look like. And, and they are absolutely invested in making sure that we do the best possible job that we can for our future students and current students. Um, <laughs> The question is, I think, more also around kind of what a minimum standard should be. And there's, there's a, a, another question actually from a user yeah. based Scott Zero. So they weren't happy with their online teaching experience. Um, and their question is, is there a minimum standard I can look at to see if my uni has breached that minimum standard? Which is, I guess it's a very difficult question, but is there, do have an answer to that, Ruth, at all? I think that's difficult to say because we don't necessarily... Um, have experience in running online learning for a course that's that's um, 
usually face to face um and our online learning courses are, have always been quite separate so i wouldn't I wouldn't be aware, uh, aware, I would look to my colleagues to see if there's something that there would be something that they, they could measure against in terms yes, of yeah. the, the I think Nicola might be, might be in a good place to, to kind of have a start at being able to answer that, which may not be in place yet. But yeah, what, what do you think, Nicola? This is a, a huge and important question. And as the regulator for students in England, we are looking at this very, very closely. Um, we... Uh, Every university and colleges that registers with us and um, if students are going to apply for student loans, then the university has to be registered with us. Uh, every university has to satisfy certain standards on quality. And we've made it very clear to university that notwithstanding the coronavirus pandemic, those standards must still be complied with. But of course, given what's happened, it's, teaching and learning is going to look different inevitably. But um, we've issued guidance uh, that makes it very clear that nonetheless standards need to be maintained. And I think um, in particular, actually, there needs to be also as part of that particular focus on the experience of vulnerable and disadvantaged students, because if you don't have access to decent IT um, or your home where you're currently based, it, it, it doesn't make it easy to learn, then your experience is going to be much, much tougher. So there's a real, within this, there's a focus particularly on disadvantaged and vulnerable students, which I think is a very important part of what a good quality education experience looks like. So what are we doing? Um, we are uh, in touch with every uh, university that's registered with us to find out what they're doing in terms of the quality of their provision, discussing that with them. Um, we're also listening quite carefully to notifications from students and student unions and third parties where they've got concerns. And uh, what we are looking to see are whether there are any patterns emerging. Um, and if we do hear that there are uh, real concerns about a particular university or a particular course, then we will intervene and we've got the power to do that as the regulator. And of course, sitting under this is the fact that students in England, um, they are... Um, They've got rights, they've got rights to complain if the quality is not good enough and they can complain to the Ombudsman, which is the office of the indicated, uh, independent adjudicator. And uh, they've got legal rights as well. So as a whole, this is a complex issue. What, can I answer the question of what good online looks like and what bad online, not in any generic sense, because what that's gonna look like for an engineering course is incredibly different to an arts course, to a nursing course, to a performing arts course. So, uh, and also all universities and colleges are very different. So this is a complex area, but we are looking at this very closely. And most importantly, I think students quite rightly have have every right to expect a good quality educational experience, notwithstanding coronavirus. And that's the test that we're going to be operating. I think linked to that, there's also the kind of regulations around universities um, kind of advertising and displaying contact hours. Uh, I guess this kind of fits in with another question from Barry Scott Zero again. So if their university announces blended learning for next year, what's the minimum amount of face-to-face -face teaching it has to provide? I guess that kind of exactly what Ruth was saying around it's not uh, it's not online learning where materials are just online it is about teaching and there being an interactive experience and therefore probably that that being contact hours um is there a minimum Ruth uh, and Nicola or should it just be kind of on the basis uh, of those of the course kind of on a case-by-case -case basis start with Nicola it's okay, okay. Um, we don't prescribe a, a, a minimum in terms of contact hours. I think for students who are thinking to, for applying um, for their first year this autumn, then one of the questions they should be asking is what is on offer in terms of face-to-face -face teaching? And I think that may well inform their judgment about whether to choose to go to one university or another. For existing students, it's slightly different. I mean, presumably they already have expectations as to what the number of hours they have in terms of face-to-face -face, um, uh, teaching and what that looks like. And if they feel they're not getting it next term and next year, then they, they should raise that with, with the university. Because as Ruth said before, um, the fact that you're having, um, the fact that this is being, it has to be delivered online, doesn't, it, it's still face-to-face -face teaching. And if it's done well, it can be very high quality. So I think students should hold universities to the same standards as they had before, notwithstanding coronavirus, but acknowledging it's gonna look different. Um, these are in very, very 
difficult topic. So we'll go for a slightly lighter question now from uh, a user called Caribbean Scholar. So this is all, all about kind of the, the experience maybe outside of, of their um, academia. So um, I'll, I'll go to you, Sam, if that's OK. So how will COVID-19 affect living in halls for incoming undergraduates? What about sports teams and other societies and how will freshers be affected? Yeah, I mean, obviously, at the moment, we're having to work um, with the current situation. Um, and obviously, that is changing constantly. Um, and we, we, you know, we want improvement um, in this. I mean, I would say with regards to online teaching, obviously, universities moved to that very quickly. But it wasn't just online teaching. Um, they also moved to online social activities as well. It wasn't just about you know, um, carrying on with your course. It was about um, supporting students' well-being, um, trying to encourage people to still mix as if they would do as if they were in the classroom or on campus. Um, and some students obviously still stayed in accommodation because they had no choice but to do so. So um, I think universities are already prepared in a way for that. Um, yes, we are following the government and PHE um, guidelines. So at this stage, we um, and any institution is not 100% sure what sports or social activities may look like. Mm. Um, but that is all being reviewed at the moment. Um, and as well as looking at programs right down to module level, um, the students union are obviously reviewing um, all of their activities and societies and working out exactly what percentage can be face to face, what we can do to make it, um, you know, just as an amazing student experience. Um, how orientation weeks will work at universities, um, how enrolment's going to work. Um, it's obviously going to be very different, but um, as everyone said, what's at the core of this is the student experience. Mm -hmm. Ruth, what, what do you think about, then about how um, universities can and, and um, SUs can still provide uh, interaction through societies and, and how it may impact freshers? Yes, of course, and I completely understand that this is going to be uh, a concern for a lot of prospective students and what that experience is going to be like. So um, just first of all, to reassure that many, all universities, I'm sure, will be looking at this and trying to figure out how to create that positive experience for our students. And it certainly is something that we're prioritising. Um, in Scotland, um, like England, we have our government um, staged plan for our phased return to normal. And um, as part of that, education and sporting activities and social activities will are is a priority, and we recognise that health and well-being and um, is is an, an incredibly important element to to uh, coming to university. And so we will be looking to as soon as we can to to have those social, sporting, health, well-being alongside our education uh, experiences um, safely and done under the guidelines of the government. Um, so I would say that we will be doing it as soon as we possibly can on campus. Um, but before that, we already have fantastic um, uh, success in creating that online community just um, with our students that run our sports clubs and societies who are normally responsible for the kind of social aspect of, of um, freshers um, and that enrollment period at university. They, they're already running, as, as Samantha mentioned, the the, the the activities online. We have chess tournaments online. We have we did a whiskey tasting event online on Zoom for our for our whiskey tasting uh, society. There's been our sports clubs. They've come together and they've created a virtual community through the use of Strava apps. They've done um, cycling challenges and running challenges, and so they've continued to to make sure that that experience is there for our current students and and uh, and they would be rolling that out for our new students as well. Um, we can do virtual events and um, that we would normally be doing in person uh, and we've we've got experience of that across the university at the moment we've we've had to learn very quickly how to use different technology to create that um, experience just out with just meetings at university we are also having um to do open days we're doing those virtually that we've in perhaps in a way that we've never done before and so we are embracing this technology as an institution to to allow us to to have that experience for our prospective students so it's certainly something i feel confident that we, we it won't be the same but we will still make sure that our students have a positive experience in their first few months that's yeah that's there's a lot there that you guys are doing uh, there's so much and i think i i do feel very lucky that we've been able well, this this whole thing has happened we've had technology to, to help us connect 
online versus maybe you know even 15 years ago and Vivian you obviously work with a lot of universities around around the UK have you seen anything in particular that's been uh, that universities have been doing that's, that's really effective at that that social practice with, with students yeah I mean one of the, the huge joys if one is allowed to say this about a, a crisis of this sort has been seeing the way that um, not only universities but individual students and student groups and societies have sort of stepped up to to create um, different ways of, um, of sort of coming together. And so we've tried to bottle it. We've got a campaign called We Are Together. And we've tried to just create a kind of um, a social space where the, the, the students who are with us at the moment, the current international students can, um, can, can tell people each other, you know, what, what it's like and to, to celebrate those sort of wonderful things you heard about the students um, making sure that they keep each other sort of motivated and, and mentally healthy, because I think that's incredibly important, the ways that, you know, universities are creating structures to keep people connected, um, you know, in this period of self-isolation. We've got an Instagram uh, channel, um, which is at wearetogether underscore UK. So if you're interested in knowing um, what the experience for our current international students is like, and um, if you follow that channel, th there are lots of international students posting stuff all the time. And we're trying to kind of create a space where people can see what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you're interested, follow that channel and, and you'll get lots and lots of these lovely little stories about, you know, dinner parties, you know, people doing relay races. There's all sorts of kind of really innovative stuff going on. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of very nice positive stories in that. I've had a look, it is, it is lovely. It's well, it's well worth a look. Uh, I think I think probably all of us have spent an awful lot of time on Zoom quizzes um, yeah. as, a, as a good way to connect with friends and family, um, for sure. So, um, so another live question here. So this is from Exam Assassin um, and getting slightly into uh, the, the deeper territory again. So um, now in terms of grade calculation, we know that that's part of their question. But their, their big question is really how this whole situation will impact particularly students from underprivileged, underprivileged schools. Um, or maybe students that we might identify as, as widening participation or maybe needing that extra support. Um, Sam, I don't know if you can have um, kind of give an answer to exam assassin there about, about how maybe you're dealing with students from, from less privileged backgrounds. I think again it's returning to the fact that each applicant is um, considered on their own merits um, and it's about it, it's about reviewing that applicant and not applying a general um, criteria to people um, it's a very individual thing and even more so this year because it's not just about um, these issues it's about people that have been affected over the last six months um, with other other things with regards to the pandemic um, and all of that needs to be taken into consideration um, where normally universities may look at special circumstances when it comes to um, exam results um, you know, we're now looking at a whole intake where we have to make um, special consideration. Um, and it's not just about the exams that have been cancelled. It's about students that have been able to still maybe take their exams from other countries, but not in the same way they would have normally done um, and have studied online. So it, it's now up to universities to make sure that it's not a one size fits all. This is very much looking at the, the, the full um, student and making sure that we give them the opportunity to to now progress. Awesome, yeah, I can completely agree. I think that's totally the right approach. Um, as as we've been talking, we also had a, a kind of a, a broader um, point on on that one. Um, and and Nicola asked this too. So uh, it's quite a long question. So um, this is from user Sophie A White. Do you think there will also be some positive changes relating to diversity at university? For instance, I recently read about the benefits of running university interviews as calls rather than in person, as this takes away some of the visual unconscious bias. Also, more adult learners will be able to access online courses more easily. How are universities thinking about using this opportunity to increase access to learning for students from all parts of society? Nicola, what do you think about that one? There may be some upsides from the coronavirus pandemic, but I, I think we've got to be realistic that this is not, this is going to be really tough. It is tough for students um, and it's going to continue to be really tough for students. And it's going to particularly impact on certain groups of students. So I think those sorts of examples are good examples of where we can learn from what's happening. But I think from our perspective, the Office for Students were 
particularly um, alert to what the impact's gonna be on um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds, as I said before, um, students with mental health conditions, students who can't access IT easily. So yet there will, be, there will be good things emerging out of this. And I think Vivian referred to some of them about some of the benefits for some people about having on learn, online um, learning environment which may suit them better. But I think there's a danger in all of this of glossing over the potential very negative impact on certain groups of students. So um, without wanting to not the fact that yes, there may be benefits and I think we should exploit them and do what we can to promote them. The reality is that this is, this is as I said before, it's really tough and it's gonna have particular impact on certain groups of students. So um, I, think, um, I think our focus is gonna be uh, acknowledging the positives and they, they may exist, but nonetheless, not losing sight of the fact that we all of us really have to make sure that the short, medium and longer term impact doesn't fall on certain groups of students who are disadvantaged already in the higher education system. Mm. Absolutely. That's a bit of a negative answer. So the question is trying to find a positive. No, it is. It, it is the reality, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, the, lots and lots of students are disadvantaged, and uh, there's so much work that widening participation outreach teams do all over the country to, to support students. But yeah, absolutely, this whole situation makes it makes it much more much more important, um, for sure. Um, we've had a raft of questions now about um, university facilities um, with sp kind of specific questions around more creative subjects. So. Um, first question then is from um, Cool KV. So, how do you expect courses that have a large practical component in, and industrial experience, for instance, arts, dramas, design, construction, etc., to be impacted in the coming academic year? Um, Ruth, well, ha, I, you know, Harry, what has a, has a really big provision of, of many of these um, very practical courses? What um, what do you think about that one? So for those courses that have those practical elements, they're, they're actually easier for us to, to bring them back onto campus safely. And it is the, the priority because we know that that is the experience that our students want. And it's the reason they've signed up to these courses. That's what they want to do. They want to have that on campus, practical hands-on experience for some of these courses. So, so that's absolutely our, our priority is, is rolling out access to, to these labs and workshops, but it is actually easier for us to do that in a socially distanced and safe, safe way. Um, and no, it's a very good question though, and I do understand that that is going to be uh, an, an important consideration for a lot of our applicants. So I would say that yes, again, check in with the universities that you're applying to, to, to find out what their plans are. Um, and that will, they will become clearer over the coming weeks and months as to what that will look like. And we'll be able to have a, a little bit more um, uh, clarity for our, for our offer holders and, and future students about what that will look like. But I would say that that is certainly going to be um, something that we should be able to do um, in, some, in some shape or form is roll out face-to-face -face access to, to these facilities, yes. And Sam, what, 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 you know, your super experience, what does your experience tell you um, here about, about how those more practical courses might be dealt with? Yeah, I completely agree with Ruth. We're, we're doing exactly the same thing. Obviously at the moment, the top priority um, we have a lot of programs again that are in studios and labs um, and, and that is vital that we get those students back in for face to face. And as Ruth said, sometimes that's slightly easier to be able to do social distancing. Um, so, as I said before, what's being looked at is not just at a program level, at a module level, um, you know, obviously teaching timetables um, to be able to spread out those classes. All of that is being considered um, in, in a very big way at the moment. Um, and then obviously once that's done and we can ensure that, that the practical hands-on students are it back in the classroom um, with the social distancing uh, requirements, then we can start to look at the other programmes and how we can make sure that with every programme there is an element of face-to-face -face teaching. Fantastic. This actually leads in again uh, another kind of big question here. So it's a very user TCL. Um, is there any truth in the rumours that universities are considering a phased return by subjects with lab-based subjects first? I hadn't heard that rumour um, at all. Um, Sam, Sam and, and Ruth, is, is that something that you're aware of as well? Um, we're personally not looking at that. Um, we are looking to, to start the term as normal um, at the same timeline that we were looking to um, before. So no, that, that's not something that we're considering at the moment. Ruth, how about you? Uh, same, uh, it's not something I've heard either. Um, for us, it's going to be a consistent approach for all of our courses. We'll be starting at the same time in September. 
um, face to face teaching where possible and um, yeah, across the board. And, and Nicola, obviously kind of working with um, all the universities, is there any truth um, in that from your point of view? Not that I've heard of, no, no. Good to know. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, we're, we're back into some really, really big, deep questions here. So um, first off, what will happen if university is in severe financial difficulty? Will they be bailed out? Nicola, question for you. Big question. I'm, I'm... It is a big question. Um, clearly, the coronavirus pandemic is putting a lot of financial pressure on universities. That is without a doubt. Um, certainly, we're not uh, aware of any um, immediate uh, risk of, of a university collapsing. So I don't think students should worry about that. Um, but if a university were to get into difficulty, then we would be working really closely with them to ensure that uh, the students were protected. That's our role. Um, and we know that government is um, alert to this and would do the same. I think the primary concern here is to make sure that students who are signing up to go to university um, can be confident that their uh, university will continue uh, to exist. And there's, you know, I, I think that, that they should feel assured that there's no um, immediate risk of that not being the case. But you know, we've got to be realistic about this. This is unparalleled set of circumstances and there are financial risks. So I think our response as the regulator um, is to be working really closely. We're in very close touch with universities to talk about their finances. Um, and our focus is entirely to make sure that students uh, are, are protected uh, should a university start having financial difficulties. But um, as I say, we're not gonna see a whole host of universities falling over tomorrow. So I, I, I think, you know, to, do be reassured that this is a very live issue. It's a very serious issue. And we're working very closely with universities to uh, make sure that students are protected. What do you think that maybe university mergers may be more likely than just being completely bailed out? Uh, yes, I think that could well be the case. And um, I think many universities simply don't know what's going to happen at this stage. Um, it, there's so much uncertainty about sources of research income, about student decision making, about decisions of international students that we simply don't know. So I suspect many universities will be simply waiting and watching uh, to see how things roll out before rushing into a merger decision. But that may well be a sensible way forward, I agree. Um, fantastic. I'm just going to answer. Uh, uh, we've got only 12 minutes to go. The time has gone so, so, so quickly. Um, so I'm just going to cherry pick a few um, key questions that we want to make sure uh, these our users get get answers to. So, um, so first off, this is from Sahir G. Um, is there any additional financial aid that universities can offer to students in hardship? Sam, do do you know if there may be any additional um, finance for students? Um, obviously, every university has their own bursary schemes um, and hardship funds, um, and I'm sure that they will um, continue to that they're going to continue to happen. Right. Um, I guess, you know, every university will be very different there in, term, in terms of what's being provided. Um, there's a question specifically really here for you, Ruth. Um, this is from a user called Lockdown Frenzy, um, apt for the time. Um, so they ask, in Scotland, will universities give priority to cl in clearing to rest of the UK students compared to Scottish students due to the fee situation? Mm, that's a good question. It's a question we often get. Um, so to make it, hopefully this will make it a little bit clearer, we, we treat our Scottish students and our um, the students coming from anywhere else um, exactly the same. And we, we, um, we have a very fair approach. But for those that are coming from the rest of the UK are funded differently. So we wouldn't prioritise Scotland over any other group of students at, or vice versa. So um, because they're funded in different ways, we can take different amounts of each group and that won't have an impact on, on the other group. So um, we will um, look to clearing for some, for some courses if we need to do that, as we do each year, we'll make a decision um, closer to the time. Um, uh, but, and there may be opportunities um, that there might not have been before due to, um, this this current landscape 
for, for prospective students. So I would say it's an opportunity for them to see what, what universities are doing um, across the UK. But I would say that it's not going to have a negative impact on anybody's opportunities in Scotland. Um, and, and we would still say to, to get in touch if that's something that they would like to consider. Um, thank you so much. I think it'd be really helpful for all the Scottish students that are, that are listening now. Um, so the next section is really about health and safety, which of course is a, is a really, really big um, area of concern for, for everybody, not, not just students. Um, so the first question is, how will universities reassure students that the possibility of infection will be minimised in halls of residence? Um, that's from user Gwil. Um, Vivian, I don't know whether you've had this conversation with, with universities. Um, is, do you have um, kind of any information about that? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be absolutely critical. And we know that this is going to be the big question, not only in prospective student minds, but also parents' minds about, you know, mm. whether it's, um, it's going to be sort of safe, effective to the UK. What I can tell you is the U UK university sector together under the auspices of Universities UK, which I, I, I where I work, um, is working on a, a, a sort of sector-wide protocol for returning to face-to-face uh, -face, uh, teaching. And so we're going to be publishing... Uh, a set of um, principles which we hope universities will find helpful in implementing the kind of measures that, that are being uh, discussed about social distancing, keeping people safe. We're also working, we've got a little task group working on quarantine because um, the government has recently announced that uh, people who are coming to the UK from over overseas uh, will need to spend 14 days in quarantine. Now that requirement is going to be reviewed every three weeks, so it's not clear that that uh, requirement will still be in place in the autumn, but if it is, um, universities will need to make sure that students uh, are managed through that process, that it's not mm. the individual student just to sort it out. So we're working on that very hard. Um, and of course, I think as you've heard from um, both Harriet West and Westminster, um, when institutions are thinking about um, decisions about how they return to, to uh, on-campus teaching, mm. uh, health and safety is going to be the first uh, priority. So, um, you know, even though everybody would love to go back to the way things were with um, you know, packed seminar rooms and uh, crowded cafes and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that if that compromises uh, health and safety. I think the other thing to make clear, and I think everybody who's applying for a, um, a place in the UK needs to know this, you will go through the visa process, you will be asked to pay a thing called the immigration, the health uh, surcharge. That gives you full access to the NHS, right? So if you come to the UK and for whatever reason, whether it's COVID-19 or something else, you've got access to our NHS and, and that is obviously free. So um, if you're worried about that, I think it's quite important. Again, talk to your universities, make sure that uh, you understand how they're going to keep you safe, the measures that they're putting in place, what's going to be happening on campus, um, but also that sort of national level support is there. Absolutely, and, and of course the NHS is a really, really fantastic system um, and provides incredible care to, to all of us, particularly during this time. Um, so can so, kind I of same question to, to you then, Sam, from kind of your experience at Westminster, um, do you, know what, do you know what your university or universities more generally are doing to um, make sure that it's as safe as possible for students? I mean, certainly that's something that they're, they're working on currently. Um, and as Vivian said, with the groups, they are making sure that they're going to be compliant. And as I say, you know, obviously it's the safety of the students and staff that are paramount. Um, what the decisions are being made currently, obviously, as hopefully we move through the next couple of months, um, you know, there'll be further guidance and hopefully things will start to improve, um, which will make it obviously a, a different experience from when students return to, to their halls. Um, we have another question from Sweeney G, um, which is uh, kind of less linked to um, that safety piece, but still really about accommodation. So this, this person asks, will accommodation cost the time universities remain closed as students won't be able to live there? I get the feeling this maybe relates less to, to next semester. There's obviously a lot, lot going into place to um, make it as safe as possible. But of course, this last semester that we're kind of in now, many students have had to move out. Um, Nicola, what, what's your view of this one in terms of refunding students, either for their accommodation or the many, many questions we're getting around um, tuition fees? Well, we don't um, regulate accommodation, actually. Um, but what we have heard from students is this is such a major issue for them. And particularly when many students are losing their jobs that have managed to pay their living costs and their rent. So it's a real double whammy, this. Uh, and what we have done is um, publish guidance on uh, what we've observed in terms of good practice 
in the sector in terms of accommodation costs and we've put that out there and certainly um, we're drawing attention to many examples where um, landlords and accommodation providers and universities have been incredibly sympathetic about students facing this situation but um, and there are some good examples out there as well as I have to say some bad examples too um, but this is not our we, we don't regulate accommodation what we do regulate is the quality of teaching and um, the question of tuition fee refunds is one that gets raised with us um, all the time Certainly, um, our focus is very much on making sure that the quality of provision that students receive is as good as can be in these circumstances. And we've been through this earlier in, in the course of this discussion, but that's very much our focus. Now, if um, students feel that they're not getting the quality of um, teaching that they deserve, deserve then, then um, they absolutely must raise that with the university. And in addition, uh, they have got rights to complain um, to the ombudsman who has in the past awarded uh, tuition fee refunds. Uh, but it's not really our job to say what uh, the appropriate fee level is. Um, <laughs> fee levels are set by government in, in England, but um, students do have rights. And if they're not getting uh, what they're entitled to, then, then they have every right to complain and take the matter forward. Absolutely. Um, we have just four minutes to go. Um, so there's been an awful lot of questions we've had from, from um, our fantastic audience. So thank you all for, for answering those. Um, this is a really difficult and, and awful time and a situation we none of us ever wanted to be in and hopefully will never be in again. Um, but I do, uh, we've had a lovely question from, from PQ, uh, user PQ, and I think maybe just ending hopefully on a, on a slightly more positive note. So um, this user asks, what would you say has been the biggest benefit or silver lining of the pandemic for universities and their students. Um, let's, let's start with you, Ruth. Um, I think we've learned a lot, I have to say. There has been a lot that we have learned. I think um, silver lining being that, that we will be able to use this as, as a, a time that we can reflect on um, and that we have been able to come together as a community at our university and really respond quite quickly and flexibly. Um, we've been able to uh, embrace digital transformation um, technology to, to make sure that we always put the student at the center of, of what we do. And I think that we will continue to use that. And I think that that's something that we, we are all really positive about the future is that those learnings we will take forward um, and that we will be able to look at the way that we um, provide our education at the university to our students and make sure that we are doing it in a way that works for the student. Um, so, this kind of accessing things online might be in some shape or form what our students want and need and it can fit around their lives and um, it's just an opportunity for us to really reflect on what works um, and take a lot of positives out of that so yeah good question. <laughs> uh, Sam what, what do you think what are the kind of the, the biggest benefits? Yeah I think obviously there's a lot of concern um, what we refer to as online teaching <laughs> Um, however, I think it has made a lot of universities review um, how they deliver their programs, as Ruth said, and actually there are a number of, of groups of students that maybe university has not been possible for them before um, to fit into their lifestyles um, and other responsibilities they have. And I think that will certainly open up. Um, I think also we talk about well-being um, and I think although universities deliver a great um, a well-being programs um, I think it's actually made us focus even more on students well-being um, and how we can actually support them even more through their studies. Fantastic. Vivian what's what's your big silver lining? I'm going to take a, a politician's approach to this and answer the question I wish you'd asked. I'm really surprised we didn't get any questions about visas. Uh, the silver lining to this has been how flexible, usually flexible, the home office has been. We've seen lots of new measures to make it possible for uh, the, the visa system to work in the current climate. We're starting to see, this is what I really wanted to say, we're starting to see the visa applications centres opening up. And for a lot of people, that's been a real mm. uh, issue. And um, we're also going to get the graduate route, which gives um, an opportunity to stay and work in the UK for two years post-graduation implemented. And we've had ministers reconfirm that as recently as last week. So, you know, from our, my point of view, um, uh, to turn the question around, I would say, we've got the um, visa system working with us and not against us, which is quite nice. As Nicola will remember from her, <laughs> her previous work on this. We're, we're just at time, so perfect timing to, to end uh, on a high from you, Nicola. 
what, what do you feel are the biggest benefits? As I said before, it is quite hard to be positive about what is really tough for so many different students. I think the, the point that Ruth and Sam made about it, it, forcing innovation on, on us is a really good one. I think also um, th this has brought a focus on um, sustainability and climate change as well. And I think that's something which will really touch a chord for many students and many of us. So I think that is a, is a positive too. So there are positives somewhere in all of this, but it's, it's tough. But you've got to hunt for them, don't you? Absolutely. Um, so we are now at time. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And thank you so much to um, the audience for writing lots of really, really thoughtful questions. I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for everyone that has been watching and also um, to Nicola, Sam, Vivian and Ruth for joining us to answer all these questions. I hope it's been helpful. Um, have a wonderful afternoon and a fantastic weekend and enjoy the continued sunshine. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.